Hey everybody, how's it going? I am Zach Peterson. I am your local technical consultant with Altium and welcome to Altium Academy. Today, we're gonna be continuing with something that we did a couple of weeks ago on PDN impedance. And so what I did in this earlier video is I showed everybody how to set up a PDN impedance simulation. Now, we actually did this to look at the transient response, we also did this to look at the impedance spectrum. So in this example, what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna extend the PDN structure out to another rail, and then we're gonna see what happens when we add some inductance, such as when we add in a ferrite. So this is a really great topic because it does get a bit controversial. And this is one of those ones where you got people on both sides of the aisle complaining about, you know, the other side is wrong and that everybody else is wrong. And it's it's really interesting and it's, it's definitely a good debate. So we're gonna get into this from the simulation side and see what actually happens in a simulation. It should be a lot of fun. Let's go ahead and get started. So just to remind everyone where we're at, we had this uh, big simulation schematic that we built uh, in Altium Designer to simulate the structure of a PDN. And if you remember, these are just kind of, uh, I guess you could say, randomly chosen capacitor values. I mean, they're, they're chosen to lie in a specific frequency range, but they're not necessarily meant to represent like specific capacitors. This was just to kind of show what happens when you add in more and more and more capacitance into the design to see what happens to the uh, transient response and the impedance. And so we got some really good results. Um, as you would expect, if I start adding in more and more capacitance, I get lower impedance. Obviously with that capacitance in parallel, that's what you get. And then uh, switch that around. If I add in uh, more inductance on this rail, uh, then obviously I get uh, higher impedance. And I also get a worse transient response that is because if you treat this entire system as a uh, basically a big set of coupled damped oscillators, what happens is increasing this inductance value brings this closer to the under damped regime or farther into the under damped regime. And so what that means is that uh, these uh, inductances as well as the inductances of all of these, uh, these capacitors uh, are essentially uh, reducing the damping constant for the transient response. We were able to see some of those peaks in the PDN impedance spectrum and then correlate those with specific portions of the transient response. So that's really cool. But next, what do we wanna do? Well, next what we wanna do is actually uh, investigate what happens when we have a PDN uh, for a, like a high speed component that also has uh, like a reference clock with a PLL. And that's really important because one thing that you will sometimes see is you will see another branch come off of this portion of the power net. So basically it will come off from this portion of the rail, come off in parallel, so kind of where I'm dragging my mouse, you could imagine, and then come off and then go to a ferrite with a bunch of capacitors. So they'll basically put the, the bypass capacitor very close to uh, this uh, example component here, or with this switching element, um, we can use that to represent uh, the input for our PLL. And then somewhere in here, uh, basically what they'll do is they will put a ferrite. Why would someone do this? Well, I actually have an article up on uh, the Altium blog that uh, looks at transfer impedance and uh, a certain way that ferrites are sometimes used to isolate different sections of a PDN into different rails. So essentially you would have here in this area or in this uh, this main schematic that we built, uh, we would have uh, essentially the power going to our IOs, uh, but then in a second set of pins, you would have power going to your PLL and that is sometimes where you see a ferrite placed. So this is another area where you might see a ferrite placed. And the, the, the stated reason is to essentially create a high impedance barrier between my IO portion of the PDN and then my PLL portion of the PDN. This is something that has, I, well, frankly, I've seen results uh, that 
confirm the use of it, meaning that it actually does reduce the transient response. And I've seen results that actually disconfirm it. So that show that it makes the transient response worse. So who's correct? Well, this is a point of contention that has gone back for, uh, you know, about 10 years or so. And that's what we want to investigate in this simulation. So in this first video, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to show you how to set up the simulation in this schematic. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll do a second video where we'll take this other schematic. And so I've got a blank schematic here that we're going to put all this stuff in. And that second uh, video is where we'll actually run the simulation and look at some of those results. So we'll try and put those out the same week so that you guys can see all of that content all at the same time. And hopefully it'll be pretty interesting. So what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to essentially break out uh, this portion of the power net uh, into this sheet. So I'm going to do that in the background and then I will draw in the uh, the ferrite and then I will also uh, bring in uh, some bypass caps and we'll put those into this sheet and then we'll set up the simulation and uh, that'll be that. In order to make room for a ferrite, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first uh, increase the size of my sheet. Um, just go to ANSI C. So it makes it a little bit bigger. Um, we can just go ahead and delete these labels here. So now we've got plenty of room to put a uh, to put all the stuff that we need for for our ferrite. And so to model our ferrite and its location or its placement, what we actually need to do is we need to draw down over to here, and then we'll place the ferrite uh, in this region over here uh, in the schematic. So it'll essentially go over here. And then what we need to do is we need to add in another switching element uh, to basically model our oscillator. And we'll just call this, let's call this guy Q2. Um, we'll just call this guy VP2. And so in building this simulation, uh, one thing you should actually do is try to better model exactly what happens here with this pulse. Um, so here we've got a period of, of one microsecond, it's basically uh, uh, one megahertz. I think what we'll do is we'll actually set this to a lower value so we can actually, you know, a bit more accurately uh, represent uh, what would happen in a IC with low core voltage levels. And then we may also want to change the rise time a little bit. Let's go ahead and change this to 10 just so that we're isolating the effects of a very fast switching element over here. So you see this is at one nanosecond and this is quite slower at 10 nanoseconds. So this is okay. And then I think what we'll do is, you know, we'll actually make this, make this two. So the reason we want to do that is so that uh, we can, again, isolate everything that's happening with this particular oscillator with the, uh, or from the, uh, everything that's happening over here with this particular switching element. So in doing that, uh, we want to actually simulate the effects of this switching element over here on this oscillator over here. And then by doing that, we're going to be able to actually validate whether or not placing a ferrite as an isolating element in the PDN is successful uh, for our particular purposes. Next, uh, we're going to have to model a couple of things. So we're going to have to first uh, figure out uh, maybe a placement for a via so we can actually go ahead and just do that here. So let's just copy that and we'll just go ahead and place it and I'll go ahead and label this LV2, label this guy RV2. And so next we have to actually uh, create a circuit model for our uh, ferrite. And so I'm going to move this over because we're going to need a little bit more room and we can go ahead and look at a part number to actually see what's going on. I've got a data sheet up for uh, a, a Murata uh, inductor type chip ferrite bead. So what is a chip ferrite? Well, a chip ferrite is basically just a ferrite bead uh, that is this form factor. It's right here. Um, so this particular uh, part. And you can go onto Octopart, uh, just search, you know, ferrite chip if you want to find a component like this. I mean, there's tons of them available. You know, here we've got 100 search pages of search results. So obviously there's you know, plenty to choose from. But I want to actually just kind of show how you would actually model this if you're going to build a simulation around this particular component. 
component. So let's look at the data sheet real quick. Now, you know, one of the things that they you might see sometimes is this kind of equivalent circuit. This is one way to model it, but it doesn't really tell you the whole story. In fact, what you have to do is you have to scroll down to the impedance graph. You'll see here there are several different impedance graphs kind of overlapped uh, for these different ferrites. And really what I want to do is I actually want to look at Here's the one I want to look at. So I want to look at this particular graph. Um, this is just for one part number uh, uh, over here. There's a very similar graph for a different part number. So we'll just look at this one for the moment. But in this graph, what they're actually showing is the total impedance spectrum. So that's Z. And then you have the reactants X. But then they're also showing R. So what is R showing you here? This is actually really important for how you actually would model the impedance. And this should explain why they put that, uh, that particular uh, uh, circuit symbol uh, up in the top of the data sheet. So here you see that the uh, reactance eventually dies out and this is as the capacitance starts to, to take over. The problem here is that the resistance is also shown as a function of frequency. Unfortunately, that is not really the way resistors work. And so it becomes kind of difficult to actually model this in a circuit uh, using just R, L, and C elements because you would basically need to have a frequency dependent resistor model uh, here that you're using for the impedance. That can get difficult. In fact, in order to actually do that, you would need uh, a specific model for your specific inductor uh, and you would have to import that as, a, as an element in your in your schematics. Here you just kind of scroll down and really you see that they're all like this. Uh, this is kind of unfortunate for us because we really have to approximate what's going on here uh, if we want to actually uh, create a circuit model uh, that, that tells us uh, how this impedance interacts with the rest of the stuff in our simulation. So all basically all of these capacitors and then the plane. First things first, what we're just going to do is we're just going to come off from here and we're going to put these guys in the simulation. Remember, this is our plane and then these are modeling our via transitions. These are actually a little low for our via transitions, but we'll just go ahead and leave it as is for now because really the inductance of our uh, of our bead is what's going to dominate here. And then so here, let me change these reference designators, change this to LP2, change this to RP2. And now we can really start to build a model for our uh, uh, for our uh, ferrite bead. The way you would typically model this is as an RLC circuit. And when I say an RLC circuit, I really mean a parallel RLC circuit. So I'd want to put one of these guys, one of these guys. Uh, I'll just go ahead and put this here and move it back. And then get a capacitor here. And we'll put it here. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and wire these up and then we'll set some values. So kind of the challenge here is to just figure out, you know, what values do I actually need uh, for these elements in order to properly model the behavior of a, uh, of a ferrite bead. So for that, you can do a couple of things. Obviously, we're not going to use, you know, 0.1 milliohms or point sorry point yeah point 0.1 milliohms and um, we're not going to necessarily use something really small like 25 picohenries so we really have uh, two pieces of information that we have to use uh, to figure out LP and then C so real quick I'm going to rename this we'll just call this LF for the ferrite we'll call R RF for the ferrite and then we'll call C CF for the ferrite. Now, the reason I went with this particular model is because if you remember from the previous simulation, we actually had a minimum in our PDN impedance spectrum when we looked in this region. And so now we have very high impedance right here in this region when we look at this ferrite bead. So we want to evaluate, is that appropriate? Is that not appropriate? Or do we maybe need to go with a lower Q uh, ferrite that would be, uh, you know, in, uh, correspond to one of these other part numbers. So this selection of ferrite is actually what ends up being really important. And these ferrites, again, have different Q values, which really depend on the, the resistance behavior as a function of frequency, and then also the total reactance behavior as a function of frequency. So let's go back to our particular uh, ferrite. We'll just look at this one. We don't really have to look at a specific one, but we'll just look at this one as just an example. What we want to do is calculate this 
frequency as a function uh, of uh, capacitance, and then we can use the impedance value uh, to figure out what the capacitance and inductance are. If you go through and you use the bandwidth of this circuit, and then you use the impedance at maximum that's shown here in the graph, um, just 150 ohms, you can actually figure out the circuit parameters that go in here. And so what you'll find is that this guy is 150 ohms uh, for my inductance I got 347 nanohenries and then here this is a fun one um, I actually got uh, 0 0.3603 nanofarads so uh, or no I'm sorry not nano uh, picofarad so very small capacitance you take those two together calculate what the uh, the resonance frequency should be, and uh, you should get back to the correct answer. This is pretty much everything that we need to set this up to try and prove that this ferrite actually does provide isolation. And, that, and actually, the, really the last uh, step here uh, would be to place a bypass cap. So we'll just kind of copy this guy over. I'll move this over. And let's actually move the source over as well. So it'd be just to place a bypass cap here, real quick and dirty. And um, then we'll just rename these designators. This is all set up and this is basically ready to go. The last thing that we'll do um, before we actually start getting results and we'll actually just kind of set this up in the next video is uh, to place probes for this simulation. Um, so that way we're gathering the measurements that we want to get. We're going to place probes uh, here just like we did here so that we can actually verify whether or not any kind of activity over in this other section of the PDN creates some interference over here in this area of the PDN. So that's going to be our job in the next uh, video. Last but not least, uh, this is pretty big for a bypass cap, so I'm going to use some smaller values. Again, I'm not choosing any particular order here, but let's just go with uh, let's just go with 10 picofarads, um, and then typically these are going to be much smaller on the uh, on the discharge, uh, just because bypass capacitors are uh, are going to need small uh, resistance to get the small discharge times. We'll reduce it by a factor 10. We'll go we'll go with 50 milliohms. Again, this is just meant to uh, to to be a, a via transition uh, back to ground, and uh, we'll leave it as one nanohenry for now. Um, you can actually find some calculators online that will let you calculate what the via inductance is if you were gonna start building uh, circuit models like this to try and model what happens in a PDN uh, when you have all of these different capacitors around. Be mindful of that and uh, pay attention to what all of these parasitics actually mean. Um, typically, if you, even if you're going with like a really small case capacitor here, this uh, inductance could be actually dominated by the via when the via is, is quite large. Um, it's only once you get to like HDI regime that maybe you get a difference. Again, it just depends on what this value of this capacitor is here so just be mindful of that so I think we're good for now on this we're gonna get to the next video here shortly and this will hopefully show you everything that you need to start doing your own PDN simulations involving ferrites I think that the results are gonna be really interesting so stay tuned check out the next video if you haven't subscribed yet hit the subscribe button and you'll see the next video come out really soon thanks everybody